There are multiple ways to keep in touch with the Wolf Connection podcast through our Instagram handle, the Wolf Connection Pod. And for comments and questions, send us an email to podcast at wolfconnection.org with your comments, questions, and guest ideas for Stephen and myself. You may hear your question answered on an upcoming podcast. Thank you for your support and howls to you all. Welcome to the Wolf Connection Podcast. I'm your host, John Kaufman. Let's talk about some more. I read this article in the Salt Lake Tribune, or actually it was a basically a special to the Tribune, and I immediately tried to contact our next individual that we have here with us. He is the founder and executive director of Western Wildlife Conservancy. He's been a professor of philosophy in Utah for 15 years. He no longer teaches, but he also has a PhD in philosophy. Uh, this is Kirk Robinson. Kirk, it's a pleasure to meet you, and thank you for taking the time out to speak with Stephen and I. How are you? Thank you, John and Stephen. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. I'm glad you got hold of me. This will be fun. Yeah, no, this is great. And uh, we've we, we've only touched in Utah once, Stephen and I, when we spoke to uh, Aaron Bott, one of the biologists there who is a wolf biologist where there's not many wolves, if any wolves at all, in the state of Utah. But so we've, it's great to really expand our, our focus and get into a state that now with the Colorado reintroduction coming, there could be some influx and we may have some things coming down the pike in Utah. But first and foremost, I want everyone to get to know you a little bit. What was your background like? Yeah. How did you get into Appreciate philosophy and, and education and then pivot in the mm -hmm. later, uh, after you, you were done in education to become part of the conservant, uh, conservation world? Okay. Well, I was born in Salt Lake city in 1948 and, um, when I was three years old, my family moved to Bountiful, Utah, about 10 miles north um, between the Wasatch Mountains and the great so the eastern shore of the Great Salt Lake. That's where I grew up and um, lived uh, in the southern part of the area where the orchards were being bulldozed under for new subdivisions. Ours was one of the first ones. <laughs> and. Uh, I remember as a child loving the the peach orchards around me in the hay fields and the mountains that I could stare at and, um, and all the opportunities for exploring. Um, and I think I got in touch with nature then and I uh, developed a, a love for being alone, in fact, out and not always alone, but I enjoyed exploring and meditating and observing. And that has just continued with me ever since. Uh, there are times when other things had an influence, I believe. I remember when I was in first, fifth grade, pardon me, um, we had a, a new book on the shelf in class called Yellow Eyes by Rutherford George Montgomery. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he wrote a number of children's books about wild animals and horses back in the 50s, primarily. And this one was about a cougar and his nemesis, Cougar George. And I was just amazed at how well he was able to get me inside the mind and experience of a wild cougar. And ever since then, I've been really interested in cougars. And of course, I became interested in wolves too. My parents both grew up in a small town in southern Idaho, uh, Oakley, Idaho, and there were descendants of pioneers. And my grandfather had a farm and a ranch, and I worked with him one summer. And I remember asking him about the old days, um, which, you know, really extended back to around the turn of the century, 18th and 19th century. Uh, where are the wolves now? Where are the mountain lions and so forth? And I don't remember exactly what, what he told me, but um, I was interested in the history of the settlement of the West and what that involved. And going back to the fur trap era, Jim Bridger, Tom Fitzpatrick and those people. And then even before that to um, Native American tribes uh, and I, I want to mention that 
I live now in the homeland of the Northern Shoshone and the Ute nations and also Paiute and Goshute uh, nations. And uh, of course this land was taken from them just like land was taken from the Native Americans all throughout the West. And um, eventually I just developed a great love for Western landscapes and the wildlife and history and the whole thing. I, I feel really at home in the Rocky Mountain region. And so I chose to remain here as an adult. So when you're, when you're getting on this path, and, and obviously it was early on, what's the... I want to talk about really the uh, what, what start what was the the impetus for you to start I guess Western Wildlife Conservancy okay. because you 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 know like I say you pivot um, from mm -hmm. teaching philosophy and things of that sort so what was what was the pivot to get there and then what's the ultimate mission and vision of the organization and and why you decided to found it I went to Ohio to graduate school in 1976. And um, within a few years, um, well, actually, yeah, during the Carter administration, there was something called the MX Missile Project, which would have had racetracks underground in the West Desert of Utah and Nevada. And that was kind of alarming. But even more alarming later, after that was killed, was um, James Watt, the mendacious Secretary of the, of the Interior in the Reagan administration. And I remember reading about what he was up to. And at the same time, I was reading Ed, Ab Ed Abbey novels, a Desert Solitaire, Down the River, and things like that. And really came to realize, as much as I liked Ohio and the experiences I had there, I didn't want to live there or anywhere like that the rest of my life. I wanted to live in the Rocky Mountain region. And so once I'd finished my coursework there, even before finishing my dissertation, I came back out West with the idea that I'd pass my CV around uh, in the summer and see if I could you know, get in anywhere. And that's how I got the temporary position as a sabbatical replacement at Montana State University. And I was so happy about that because I didn't really want to live in Utah again. I'd been there, you know. <laughs> um, but that was a temporary position and there was nothing else for me to do there once that was over and I ended up back in Utah. But during all this time, starting in 1979, while I was still in graduate school, I'd come out to go, well, even before that, every summer I would come out and go backpacking in the Wind River Mountains or the Uintas. And I got some of my professors to come with me. And we continued that tradition for a number of years. And um, then in 1979, um, the Utah Wilderness Association was founded. That was before the Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance, uh, SUA, which you may have heard of. The Utah Wilderness Association was instrumental in getting the Utah's biggest will and first wilderness uh, passed, the uh, Ayuntas Wilderness, um, east of Salt Lake, 80 miles or so. And that's it, Utah's largest and highest mountain range. So I got to know those guys and um, became a charter member of that group. And eventually there was a spinoff group to that called the Utah Wildlife, Wildlife Manifesto. And um, I became part of a small group, I think, if I remember correctly, starting in the winter of 1989, we began meeting, I believe it was every two months, um, and talking about how we could change wildlife governance and wildlife management. It was, it was one of the first such efforts, I'm, I'm sure, of that kind anywhere in the United States. Um, and Eventually, that group disbanded. And meanwhile, I was teaching philosophy. And I wasn't getting a tenure track position anywhere I wanted to be. I was getting older. And frankly, more and more disenchanted with the whole thing. Um, it was at a time when 
people like me were highly exploited. I didn't even have a parking permit the places where I, I taught. And uh, that's thankfully changed a lot now. But what it really led to then was me just deciding it was time to move on. And it just so happened about that same time um, that I saw an ad in a paper for a meeting at the local Unitarian Church for a new group called the Utah Cougar Coalition. And since I'd already been working on cougar issues for about seven years, I decided to attend. And once the founder of that group uh, learned that I already had been involved for a long time, I became a board member. Then about a year later, I inherited the organization when he moved on. And I actually changed the name of it and, uh, and got a new board and a whole bunch of things like that. And this was about the time you know, just a year, year and a half after the reintroduction of wolves to central Idaho and Yellowstone. And I knew at the time that they would be coming south and they would be coming from the greater Yellowstone down through the Salt River and Wyoming ranges into the mountains of southeastern Idaho, the Bear River Range, which runs north and south, crossing the border of Idaho and Utah, and on down to potentially the Wasatch Mountains and the Uinta Mountains. And it would just be a matter of time. Also, one other thing I'll add right now is that uh, Wayne Owens, who was one, a Democratic or Democrat um, representative from Utah at the time, um, introduced the legislation for reintroduction of wolves in the, on the House floor. And, um, so at that time, there, were, there seemed to be some interest in having wolves in Utah. Uh, one other thing, I, you asked also about the vision and, and mission and so forth. And so maybe it's appropriate, unless you want to ask, ask me something else right now, for me just to say a little bit about that. I, so, okay, I took over the organization. And um, the, the, I can't remember word for word, but... Um, we envision, you know, a wild landscape, connected landscape, um, complete with original native wild creatures throughout North America, really. I got involved with Wildlands Network early on, which was a spinoff from the Wildlands Project started by Dave Foreman. And so I got involved with that and worked on a wild, one of the Wildlands Network design um, projects here. Um, but at the same time, I became interested also in ethics, um, wildlife ethics. And that was kind of a spinoff from my philosophy. I studied mainly epistemology and philosophy. Uh, but then as I got more interested in wildlife and conservation, uh, more in, I developed more of an interest in ethics as well. And so I'm not just interested in traditional conservation and restoration. I'm interested uh, as well in how wild animals are treated. And so that's part of our vision too. And um, our mission is just to do what we can here in Utah to try to further uh, wildlife, native wildlife conservation with an emphasis on wild predators, of uh, mammal predators, because they're so interesting for one thing, and they few in number and highly persecuted, and they, you know, they just seem to need that kind of attention. And of course, and I was always thinking of old yellow eyes all the time too, and the possibility of wolves in Utah, and so that became our focus. And we try to do. I'm not a scientist by training. But I have learned a lot of the science, conservation biology, since 1989. Um, read lots and lots of studies. And my background in epistemology and philosophy of science enables me to understand that stuff. So I am interested in really the whole package of um, science, ethics, and even the politics and, and the law. And it kind of had to be that way here in Utah because there was nobody else working on these things after the um, 
Wildlife Manifesto Group disbanded. And one last thought. Um, mainly, all this time, I've just responded to opportunities. When something comes up in the news regarding one of these species, I try to think of something that I can do to help be, bring public awareness to it. And we put on um, Zoom videos uh, to educate the public and various other things. So that's rather long, but I, I hope it covers the subject maybe a little more. Is that is that what you feel is the main approach of the Western Wildlife Conservancy is, is public education or do you meddle in lawsuits, things of that nature? Or what's the main approach of, of Western Wildlife Conservancy? It's sort of like trying to be a local Socrates, a gadfly. <laughs> just you know, pointing out the, the issues and the problems as much as possible and, and trying to bring them to prominence. It's a very difficult in Utah. I don't know if either of you have ever spent much time here, but it's such a... People here, um, by and large, are just not aware of a lot of these things. And uh, they don't have much concern or interest in getting in learning about them or getting involved. They tend to think everything is good, you know. Government is, is doing a fine job. We don't need to worry. And um, we don't have a lot of news outlets either that are willing to uh, help us give voice to these issues. So it, it's been a big challenge and we're not a big enough organization to engage in um, litigation ourselves. In fact, the whole time I've done this, I've partially funded myself with my own money. Um, but what we what has happened is over the years, I've become very well connected with a lot of other groups. For instance, Project Coyote, Wildlands Network, and a new group called Wildlife for All uh, that I was initial helpful in initially getting started. And, and a few others. And so I have leveraged my whatever I've got to offer through these other groups and tried to um, you know operate in to some extent outside the boundaries of Utah. And, um, and hopefully as other places begin to make changes, eventually Utah will as well. And um, so to get back to education, a lot of it. I think really does fall under the heading of education, but it ta education takes different forms. A lot of it's just trying to make people aware uh, and also putting as much pressure as I can on our state wildlife board and the Division of Wildlife Resources. Um, I don't, it's not a personal thing for me. Uh, I don't know how any of them feel about it, uh, but. I, I'm not afraid to speak out and say what I think. And, and, you know, they're free to try to argue with me if they want to. They never have. <laughs> so, never once. Oh, wow. And they don't have to because they have the power. <laughs> yeah. well, since we haven't had too much Utah wolf talk up to now, can you just give us an overview of the basics as it stands in Utah? I can't find a lot of really recent updated articles. I mean, the last one I saw was, I mean, there's some stuff earlier this year, but are there, are there even any whispers of established packs anywhere in Utah or just, just transients every now and again, or, or and what's their protect, protection status right now? Um, yeah, first of all, mostly transients and they either come into the state and then leave or they, in a few cases, they've been killed here. Um, the most famous one was, um, was a 253, otherwise known as Limpy, <laughs> black wolf from Yellowstone that showed up in uh, Morgan County, just over the mountain here for me in 2002. And then he was, he had a hurt foot, but he went on to found his own pack in central Yellowstone. He was captured and taken back, which is, arguably contrary to the Endangered Species Act, but that's what happened. And then the next famous one was um, Echo, the wolf that came from north of Yellowstone down through the center of Utah all the way to the north rim of the Grand Canyon. I think that was in hmm. 2012. Yeah. Uh, she couldn't find a mate. She eventually doubled back and was killed by a coyote hunter. 
mm. uh, east of Cedar City. Um, but there have been others, and at least one of them has gone on into Colorado where it was hit by a car, and uh, various things have happened to them. There are no known packs, not known to me anyway. Um, we do have a wolf management plan um, that will kick in whenever wolves are no longer covered by the Endangered Species Act in Utah. And of course, it presupposes that there are wolves to manage in some sense. Um, but right now, there are no wolves to manage. And right now, most of Utah is um, you know, within the protected habit habitat of protected wolves. Um, all but a small part of northern Utah that abuts uh, southwestern Wyoming and southeastern Idaho, which was originally included in the Northern Rockies Gray Wolf, um, what do they call it? Population, distinct population segment. And the reason that that was included was because that, that basically includes the Bear River Range that I mentioned earlier, which was sort of foreseen all along as a very likely travel route for wolves venturing south from Yellowstone. Um, and then I, I should probably mention that uh, we could receive wolves from the Mexican wolf reintroduction too at some point. As you may know right now, there is one headed towards Colorado and New Mexico. And there have been at, at least 12 different wolves, Mexican wolves that strayed beyond the uh, I-40 highway that bisects New Mexico and Arizona. And some have been killed and some taken back because that's an artificial boundary that was established that they're not supposed to stray beyond. But, but that could change at some point. And uh, so I've just stayed, um, tried to stay in the loop on everything concerning wolves, not just wolves, but wolverines and lynxes and other critters. Um, but obviously wolves are the, you know, the most salient issue. They're the species that has the most prominence right now. And so most of my attention goes to them. It's, uh, it's, wi it's wild that there's, I love how we as humans create artificial boundaries for a wild creature and saying that you can't cross said point to, <laughs> to go wherever they need to go. It's just wild to me that we do that. I, I wanted to just, there were two things that struck me about the stuff that, that the Western Wildlife Conservancy does. And I, I wrote it down here that, that really struck me is that you guys are uh, for holistic ecological based wildlife management, which I love and democratic and scientifically virtuous wildlife governance that treats wild land and wildlife as public trust. I know that's something that Stephen and I have really started to touch on more in the new year. And really since I've gotten back from the symposium is, is this talk about wildlife and wild land coming, getting pulled away from the public and really starting to be privatized, which is, which is, crazy in and, in and of itself that there are groups out there looking to privatize as much land as possible and make it nearly impossible for any of those hunters and outfitters that want to hunt ethically, they, they'll be priced out of this stuff. So it's just, I'm glad that you're the group that you're, that you have founded that is part of that, uh, that going forward as you want to make everything still available and, and available to all. Um, with wolves in Utah, what's your? Could could you touch on this in, in the in the Tribune piece that you did? Is that a lot of the data, or there's there's a part in here? Uh, and tell me if I pronounce this right, Kirk, because I know you're you're from Utah. Is it Utah Utahins? Is it Utahns? Is that what how it's called? Well, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, that's the way I learned it. Learn it, okay. You know, with the A in there, the extra okay. A, but sometimes I violate that and leave it out. Utahns is fine with me. Utahns, yeah. But you were saying there, and and a lot of this is uh, is going against, and it's saying that Utahns are are not so enthusiastic about the return of the apex predator, meaning wolves, but it's at odds with public opinion surveys, and this is going back almost over twenty years. 
where a Utah State University survey found that more than three times as many Utahns like or strongly like wolves than the opposite of dislike or strongly dislike. Where is the disconnect from, is it like you were saying that the public is not informed or not aware of policies that are happening about these big apex predators and when we talk about mountain lions and, and wolves and things of that sort, wh where, where, does, where does the rubber meet the road here on why people, when you say wolves, they say yay, but it's contradictory to what uh, is reported? Well, you know, one can speculate quite a lot, and I try to resist doing that publicly. Um, but one thing is clear. Um, first of all, about 85% of the population of Utah lives along the Wasatch Mountains, uh, either in front of the range or in increasingly behind the range, places like Cache Valley, Ogden Valley, Heber Valley. Um, and most of them do not hunt. Uh, and so they tend to be the demographic that like wolves more. But why that is so is another matter, but it's a trend that you find just about everywhere. Then <clears throat> the more rural areas um, where there often are more hunters as, as well, it's the, that's the other pole of the continuum. And um, the unfortunate fact is that they actually control the politics. They dominate the politics of how wildlife is governed, how uh, wildlife as a resource is governed. And that means ultimately how it's managed whether they're hunted, how they're hunted, when, so forth. And um, the vast majority of the population has no say. And uh, theoretically they could if they went to the meetings and spoke out. But my experience in 33 years is actually 34 next month is that, that doesn't make any difference either because the, the wildlife board and another board that we have that's not common in other states called the five regional wildlife advisory councils are all stocked with uh, those other the traditionalists. Uh, by the way, I just before this, I listened to the podcast from last Friday, Matt Barnes, and uh, um, pardon me, her name just momentarily. Um, skipped my mind, but anyway, I thought they both did a, a great job and I agree pretty much with everything they said. And, um, but so they're all traditionalists. And so by and large are the people in the legislature. The legislature itself is about a five or 90% Republican. So, um, and so it's a, you know, they just have views uh, that go back to the frontier era that Matt was talking about. And uh, it's just hard to break through that because it's, it's a worldview and a culture together. And uh, they're not quite the same thing, but it's a shared worldview. And... Um, it's just like any shared worldview anywhere, you know, it's going to be resistant to change. It doesn't really matter what the arguments or the evidence are. Um, it's just going to do everything it can to um, preserve itself. And so, um, you know, I always have a tendency to want to delve into the reasons for that, going back into LDS doctrine and Christianity in general, et cetera. And also just the, the frontier mentality. But I don't think that would be very useful here. Um, it wouldn't help us resolve any of the problems. And I don't really want to be antagonistic towards these people. 
any more than I feel that I should. I try to resist it because ultimately we have to find some way to work with them. And um, my belief is that education, getting back to that, in the long run is going to have to be a big part of it. It just takes a long time, you know, to, to change these things. And uh, I can't do it all by myself. I have to, or let alone West, you know, myself or Western Wildlife Conservancy, it is going to require a lot of other incremental changes all around the country and the world. And so I'm just trying to stay on top of what's going on and doing what I can to keep the ball moving forward a, a little bit. Yeah, because I'm looking at, and, I, and I'm sticking with this because we, I, 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 if I mess up his name, please correct me here because I'm not trying to do this. Um, On yeah. pay? Pay, thank you. Okay. Okay, so because because we're we're talking about Don Pei, he's the chief. Uh, well, he's the founder of of Sportsmen for Fish and Wildlife, and in here the article quotes it. And I and I'll get to what you were just saying before, Kirk, because I, I want to respond to that as well and and keep down this this path. He essentially saying that the wolves will be a billion dollar problem knocking on Utah's door. I guess this is. With wolves coming back to Colorado, they could leak into Utah and, and all this. This could be an economic problem. You rebute that pretty pretty heavily in the article with with facts and, and things of that sort. And I, I know that we're talking about uh, 3,000 wolves or about 75,000 dead elk. Wolves of that number would kill every elk in Utah, which I, I, many of the studies and many of the individuals that Steve and I have had on have said – the elk numbers in all of the Rocky Mountain states, Wyoming, Idaho, and Montana have seen all these, all these populations are over objective. There's no management other than human management there, hunting and things like that, which can't get these down. And yet wolves are obviously, you know, monitored and, you know, objectified to the, you know, the wolf, you know, per wolf, essentially it's, if packs get, you know, two or three over the amount that we want, we have to really scale back. In reference to Utah, how is this, how do you say in more terms that this would not be an economic problem, but it could essentially be an economic boost for Utah if wolves were to them make their way back into the state? Well, there are various things that can be said there, but I think the most important, a important one is that we haven't seen this kind of economic devastation anywhere else. Where's the where's the data to back up that claim? But Mr. Payne never, ever, ever cites research. He just enunciates, proclaims. Uh, you know, and he's done that ever since I've known him for about 30 years. And uh, it never, his tune never changes. So, um, in the absence of any solid evidence for the claim, I don't know that it really needs to even be rebutted. But there are reasons for going on and saying other, a few things. We do know that um, gateway towns to Yellowstone National Park have um, seen tourism increases, which have been an economic advantage for them since wolves were reintroduced. In fact, many years ago now, I uh, can't remember how many, but maybe as many as 20 years ago, um, I think it was John Duffield was his name, a, an economist at, Mont at the University of Montana, did a study in which he, I'm just going by memory here, but he calculated that gateway communities reaping something like $35 million more a year because of people going to Yellowstone to see wolves. Now, if that was even just 10 years ago, let alone 20, you know, you got to figure it's probably twice that now. So uh, now Utah doesn't have places like Yellowstone where you can just go watch wolves, but it's hard for me to believe that uh, it wouldn't be actually a, a positive thing for Utah tourism 
because people like the idea of wolves and knowing they're out there and even having the chance of maybe hearing one howl or seeing one, or just imagining them on the landscape is, is something that people want. Um, and I think that's behind the, the numbers in the survey that uh, John mentioned earlier too. Um, you know, when people were queried about whether they like wolves and uh, how much they like them, people have a very romantic view of wolves and it's somewhat enlightened by modern ecology, even though they don't know the details, they absorb that. And, um, and, uh, and I don't see anything wrong with that. Now we, we do acknowledge that they do kill livestock sometimes, but we also know that the numbers are really, really small. And we also know that the uh, numbers that are killed can be um, kept small if we uh, take proactive measures to prevent um, predation on livestock. And, and um, the previous podcast made a lot of a big point of that. And uh, so, you know, um, I just don't see any way you talk and lose economically. I honestly yeah. don't. Now, that said, it is true that sometimes a particular livestock operator suffers a big loss and there need, does need to be a compensation plan. Uh, and uh, the compensation needs to be based on, you know, verified loss to wolves or whatever, whatever native predator it might have been. But, you know, Truly, from everything I've ever read or heard, losses of sheep are as likely to occur from feral dogs as anything. <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. Uh, so I think people, I'm going to bring something up right now that I think is really important, and maybe we can talk about it a little more whenever you guys want to, but it's the role of science in all this. And unfortunately, these days we see science being politicized as though it's just a matter of opinion, you know? Um, if it's just a matter of opinion, how is it we've got a, a Hubble telescope in the sky, you know, that we've got vaccines for uh, diseases and we're not dying from the plague, that we've conquered polio pretty much and all those wonderful things, you know? Science is the best thing we have for getting as accurate a picture as we can of how the world works. Um, it's never going to be absolutely infallible, I don't think, but it's getting closer and closer all the time. And it's politically, it's the one thing that can unite us all if we will respect it. Uh, we, first of all, need to look at the best science and let that inform our judgments about ethics and and um, policy. And that's a big part of what I would like to convey to people. I think it's absolutely essential. And so we need to combat all these people that are launching conspiracy theories and, and um, pretending that there's science is just somebody's opinion. You know, that's not helping anybody. So, well, actually, for, I have two questions, but you just mentioned something that um, I wanted to touch on. How do you personally isolate uh, what, you're what you call the best science, I mean, that, that you use to further your education? How, how do you, what was your process to isolate that? Because that's, I mean, in, in my observation, that's the hardest part these days is isolating what is real, what's not real, what's the best science, and what's propaganda. It's a fantastic question, and it's a very difficult problem. Um, for one thing, we know that everybody, including epistemologists like myself, are prone to all kinds of fallacious reasoning. And because we're also emotional beings, and uh, in part, um, and our personal experiences are always limited, and nobody can know everything and so forth. But there are standards. When it comes to, for instance, Pardon me. Um, how many elk there are in the hunting units around Yellowstone 
you don't just make a pronouncement out of thin air that, that you want people to believe. There are data. Now, elk counts are not perfect, but the fish and game agencies are pretty good at uh, estimating from year to year, at least trends, and also estimating habitat capacity and so forth. And um, so that's the best science. Let them do their job and take that into consideration when making decisions. If later on they learn something more, accept that too, because uh, the science is, <coughs> pardon me, the unknown is kind of like a frontier and science is constantly trying to push back the, the boundary of the frontier. And we should expect to have to change our opinions from time to time. Uh, one other thing in this connection, you know, you, it's well known in, among philosophers, at least, that you cannot logically derive a value statement from a set of factual statements. You cannot list a number of scientific facts, for instance, and draw as a deductive certainty the conclusion that something is good or, or, or ethically right. And from, but that doesn't mean that the two are completely unrelated in any way at all. It just begs the question, well, then what, what is the relationship between fact and value? <clears throat> and that's a hard thing to say, especially in a short time. I mean, a person can spend their entire career, which is pretty much what I've done, <laughs> trying to get clearer about that. But one thing is obvious is that you can't make good value judgments, even in the arts, let alone value judgments in ethics and politics, without knowing the relevant facts. It just can't be done. And so states like Utah, they, they have just not caught on to that by and large in this state. It's struggling right now. I mean, things are starting to change. Um, within the last few years here with the alarming uh, demise of the Great Salt Lake and a few other things that people are starting to wake up to the fact that they can't just manage things on the basis of um, hope and prayer. It's got to be done via science and uh, same thing for wildlife. Uh, okay, so this is, a good, uh, this is a good lead up to my next question. So with the best with the best science that you've come across, can you explain for someone who, who is hearing this sort of simplistic, outdated view of predator-prey relationship, predator management type, type information, how can we make rational this reality where more wolves actually doesn't mean, or doesn't simply mean less ungulates, which might seem like a solid and obvious approach to someone who hasn't dug into the crates, if you will, on this subject, yeah. but somehow it actually means more ungulates in some states. I mean, how in your presentations do you explain this in your own words that, that makes it digestible? Well, you know, as a former teacher, I'm used to sort of carrying on probably too long many times, but there, that's because, you know, the answer is not really simple and straightforward in many cases. But when I'm being at my most mindful, what I try to do is just hit on the most obvious points that anybody can appreciate if they just reflect on them a little bit. So for instance, in the article in the Tribune, um, where Pace quoted as saying, 3,000 wolves will mean the end of elk in Utah. Well, I was just talk about how many elk there really are. I used Colorado as an example. Um, there are fewer than 100,000 elk in Utah. I think it's around 80 or 85,000 statewide. Um, but with three, a number of 300,000 elk, if I recall um, the estimate, I might not remember precisely, but was maybe 12,500 elk would be, oh, I'm sorry, it was with an estimate of 500 wolves, 12,500 elk might be killed. Well, okay, so I'm not just, you know, I'm not just saying that. Um, in the article, I said that's based on information from Yellowstone. Now, I didn't uh, add a citation to any research because you don't do that in a commentary in a newspaper, but I can do that. And so that's what I would do. And that's the sort of thing that Don Pei has never done. 
you know, and uh, he relies on fear to try to motivate people. And primarily, he worries people about economic impacts. That's always been um, his thing. And, you know, and somehow in all of this, it's my fault mainly, but we haven't really gotten into the privatization of wildlife issue that you originally um, asked about. And we can do that at any time you want. I can say more about that. But Pay was kind of the pioneer of that here in Utah with the founding of Sports Mover Fish and Wildlife. And it spread to other states. And at one point, I think they had uh, Sportsman for Fish and Wildlife chapters in seven states, New Mexico, Wyoming, and probably Idaho, Montana, and a couple of other states. Um, but I heard Pay himself at one time at a meeting, the state capitol with a US representative from Idaho. Helen Chenoweth was her name, got up and speak and say that public lands are a blessing. He doesn't say that anymore. Mm. You know, that was a 20 some mm. odd years ago. Um, and he, along with some other groups like the Mule Deer Foundation, the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, started something called the Western Hunting and Conservation Expo here in Salt Lake every February. And they've tried to kind of um, appropriate the brand of being conservationists, of course, with the quote, North American model of wildlife conservation, or wildlife management. Um, and they auction off really high money items there, tens of thousands of dollars for once in a lifetime hunts. And they, the organizations that put on this, Expo get some of the proceeds. The Division of Wildlife Resources get some of the proceeds. The landowner, if it's on public land, gets some of the proceeds. And it has to be a guided hunt from an outfit, you know, a licensed outfitter, and they get some of the proceeds. And um, you know, common people can put in a raffle on a raffle for that. Um, and, and maybe one or two people will get one of those prize hunts. But for the most part, it's very, very wealthy people that get them. And uh, so, you know, Carl Mullo, for instance, I think was the first person to shoot a mule deer buck on Antelope Island. Unfortunately, no longer an island, but in the Great Salt Lake, where the herd had been isolated and had trophy bucks. And if I remember correctly, he paid $130,000 for the opportunity. Of course, uh, he was guided to the spot where the, the buck was. Um, that, that's the thing that's happening more and more. And, um, and it's heavy, heavy on trophy hunting. Not just big game, but trophy animals. And uh, I think that's an unfortunate trend. How do you individuals in the state from your perspective i know it's i know it's education <clears throat> pardon me and it's teaching and it's learning and getting people to realize what's actually happening are there meetings that are happening dedicated to privatization of public lands and these hunts are these separate from a lot of the meetings that are happening, can individuals who are Utahns join these meetings so that they can see what's happening? Where is the separation going? Because we spoke with Nick Jivak, who was really driving this home about the privatization of public lands and mentioned Antelope Island, I believe, Stephen, I can't remember per, uh, uh, off the top of my head, but where you're right, Kirk, this trophy hunting and going to these exotic places where you can spend ungodly sums of money to shoot wildlife. W w again, I, I, I find it tough to believe that there's, and I know it's there and I'm not saying it's not. It's just, it's fascinating to me in a way that's scary that people who live in this, live in the state are unaware that this is happening 
sort of in conjunction with their daily lives and it's just going to continue to happen and grow? What, what's, what's the way to curb that, Kirk? Is there a way to help them get informed more than just teaching? What, what's, what's something they can do? Well, um, anybody listening to this podcast, for instance, could do some of their own research to learn what's going on. I'll just mention one thing that's new to me. There's a new book published in 2022 called This America, This American Land of Ours, or something like that, um, <clears throat> by a journalist named Nate Schweiber. Um, it's kind of a biography of Bernard DeVoto. You've heard of him. <clears throat> who was kind of a mentor of, for Wallace Stegner. Both DeVoto and Stegner lived in Utah. In fact, DeVoto was born here up near Ogden. Um, and Stegner lived in Salt Lake City for a period um, in his teenage years, but and on into college. Anyway, there's an amazing history there that I'd never heard about. We've all heard of the so-called sagebrush rebellion, and I guess there are some differences of opinion in exactly when that occurred, when it started, but most people think it happened in the 70s, either with somebody bulldozing a road in Nevada or something happening in Colorado. But way back in the 40s and 50s, there was already a movement to privatize public lands in America, and it's detailed quite heavily in this book. It's worth reading for that alone. And also, the extent that it was interconnected with McCarthyism in strange ways, strange ways that you wouldn't just imagine, you know, that just sort of came together um, accidentally. And I think that's kind of the way it is now with respect to um, the take back, quote, take back public lands movement, which was very strong in Utah and with the Utah legislature and um, trophy hunting. It's not that they're purposely aligned with each other, that they just each see their own advantage in it. Right. So Utah, you know, going back to, this is not just true of Utah, but it's especially true of Utah, I think, because of the Mormon pioneer heritage and the idea of this being Zion. I promised land for the saints came west. Um, that is a sense of a kind of ownership and a resentment towards the federal government forever interfering, you know, getting involved. Um, they eventually had to become a state and there had to be some, you know, connection with the rest of the United States when that happened, obviously. Uh, and it was to the economic advantage of Utah that they did that finally. But they still, there's still this tradition of resentment and anti federalism. And that has a lot to do with the hatred of wolves. Because they're kind of, the, the feeling is that they've been foisted on us. It was a good thing to get rid of them. And now it's the, um, the elites from the coast and the liberal politicians, um, you know, subjecting to us to them once again. And the same thing with public lands, what we can do on the public land and what we can't. And um, there's little truth at all to the idea that the states were meant to have these public lands. That's been demonstrated over and over again by research. Um, I know fellows at the University of Utah, for instance, have written white papers about this, but it doesn't deter the Utah legislature from doing their um, message bills every year and spending millions of dollars for out-of-state uh, legal firm, law firms to try to litigate this. Um, why? Wait, they want those lands for themselves. Mm -hmm. About 40% of the Utah legislature have uh, um, professional ties of one kind or another to real estate development. They, they want these lands to develop them in one way or another or, or to make money from them for themselves, their friends, and for the state. And they feel that, that they're being cheated and robbed. So that's their interest. And the big game hunters, of the, you know, the sportsman proficient wildlife types know the, that politically this is the most powerful 
um, force in the state. So they want to align with that and, and the hope that uh, that means that they can hunt big game forever, you know, which is another organization that Pay helped found with another guy named Ryan Benson um, by that name, Big Game Forever. But that, that's how the two come together. And then it's another part, piece of the puzzle, how oil and gas and energy development enters into that. Um, My goodness. But I, I it, think I'll stop right there. No, it's, <laughs> for it's now anyway. It's, again, I keep coming back to this point that for, if this, if the wolf was a human and I think understood the amount of turmoil it caused just by being alive and doing its own thing on the planet, I, I think it would stop and look at us and really have a questioned look on its face. Because I, again, I, I say this a lot that this is the one species that I can, I mean, again, we, we are a wolf podcast. We work with wolves. We talk about wolves, but for a species like this to be at the center of so many different things happening across the country and globally and to impact political and social norms again is, is something that I don't know if I ever, I don't know if I ever thought doing us starting this podcast and having these conversations would have <laughs> continued to no. blare itself right in front of our faces as much as possible. But it, again, it, it just still strikes me that it, it's a species trying to go about <laughs> its daily life to wake up, eat, feed its family, den. It just wants to eat and survive. You started by saying that if you were this uh, somewhat um, fictitious wolf, you would have a question, but you didn't really quite say what the question was. Mm. What question do you imagine this, these wolves asking themselves? I I think they would just simply ask asking, why. Where's the food? I I think. I, wh I think yeah, where's the food? Funny. And but but why? Because well, to, yeah, let's to turn me, it around. We are. Why don't we ask ourselves that question? You know. Yeah. Why Why are we doing what we do? Yeah. Um. Why aren't we more willing to change and to be open to? Uh, evidence and uh, there's no simple single answer to that but people like security which means they like easy answers and they like to have their imprimatur of authority on those answers so they don't have to question them they like generality they don't like going into detail and combing through detail to try to make distinctions they just want to have it as it were you know cut and dried that's the that's our nature at least the nature of yeah. most human beings and I, and I can understand that and I can understand that to a degree I mean there are people that have again your your forefathers and your ancestors Aaron Bott's uh, family going back generations they they moved westward and they they found these these places and settled and it was, I can't fathom the hardship that was, that happened moving to a new, finding, founding new places. Also, obviously, in conjunction with the amount of horrible things that happened because of that movement, as in, like you were stating before, Kirk, at the beginning, taking native land away and extirpating a lot of these apex predators and, and really throwing the ecosystem out of out of balance it just you would think in this time where there is almost limitless information limitless information really at our fingertips that you can see how the way that we can evolve we can get back to a situation or a place that we we should be able to coexist with all of the knowledge that we have with all the things that we've learned throughout the course of our history, our, our young history as a, as a country, that we would be able to understand a way for human beings and 
animals and fa- you know fauna, megafauna, and plants and the and the and the ecosystem to be in coexistence with each other, so that it helps everything to survive and thrive, as opposed to again still trying to manage and make sure that it's feasible for us to hunt or do whatever we need to do that impacts these creatures or these plants or these bodies of water in a way that ultimately is is not going to serve us in the long run. Well, let me respond to that and, um, because I think it, you know, this is an important topic and um, trying to understand where people are coming from is always important, I think, in order to really deal effectively with conflicts and to also, if we're going to be empathetic, empathetic with their point of view to some extent. Um, I mentioned earlier the the Mormons coming into what was essentially a desert. They were driven westward across the Missouri, the Mississippi and Missouri River and in stages really, and uh, ended up in a place they thought nobody else wanted. And um, then it too was absorbed by the United States of America. And that turns out that like 70% of the land within the borders of Utah is federal land. You know, and they, there's a resentment of that. But also, uh, and I'm going to speak particularly of Mormon culture here because I come from that culture. And in fact, I'll preface this by saying, you know, I was raised a Mormon. I was even a missionary in California between 1967 and 1969. I was uh, in the Bay Area, San Francisco in 67, the summer of love. <laughs> it's kind of an interesting time. Uh, I'm no longer affiliated in any way with that religion. And it's been over 50 years since I left. But I, I think I understand that culture very well. And I, I can see both sides. As I mentioned earlier, I had a grandfather who was a rancher. Um, he was a, a real cowboy, you know, and I, I appreciate the history, but um, getting back to the Mormon, okay, and this is just a particular brand of Christianity, as a matter of fact, and as far as that goes, a particular brand of Western religion in general. I used to teach world religions quite a number of times when I was teaching, but it's the emphasis on a hereafter that the, this world is just a temporary place. And how we do here with respect to keeping certain commandments determines our uh, estate in an afterlife somewhere, wherever that may be. And I think it, the truth is that Mormon culture by and large does not appreciate uh, the earth the way they should. Of they know from the Bible that God Bible says God created it all and pronounced it good. But the way they tend to interpret that was good for human beings. It's here for us. Quite literally, I used to hear this all the time. You know, it's here for us to make use of. And the, the furthest they've gotten, by and large, until recently, there have been some changes that I'll mention, um, is, well, good for us and our posterity. That means we've got to be good stewards. And we have to be, to that extent, conservationists. So we don't want to use it all up right now. We want to, you know, renewable resources should be allowed to renew and so that our posterity can enjoy them too. So there's that. But that doesn't cover everything. That, that mostly, and when it comes to wildlife, that mostly means deer and elk, you know, <laughs> and fish. And the rest are sort of, well, if they don't get in, causes a problem, we'll leave them alone. Um, so there's that's been a, a predominant view that I've seen in Mormon Utah culture all my life. And uh, now there are exceptions to that. You don't, it's not like everybody has that view. Right. And more recently, we see people changing. Um, there's a young man, Ben Abbott, who is a, an ecologist who happens to be a Mormon at BYU, who's leading the opposition to 
a big scheme to uh, dredge Utah Lake and make a whole bunch of islands and put high priced homes on them. And also leading the way to uh, save Great Salt Lake. And uh, in 2013, I actually helped I was a co-founder of a group called Mormon Environment, pardon me, Mormon, Mormon Environmental Stewardship Alliance, um, acronym MESA. And I stayed with him for about six years trying to help, help it get going. It had a rough period. And I, it wasn't quite going the direction I thought it should. Too much emphasis on the stewardship, in my opinion, which implicitly has it that God created it and it's his and our main moral obligation to nature is to just take care of it for him you know and I that doesn't sit very well with me um but now Ben Abbott is on the I think he's um since I left there he's on the board and there are more people like that coming to it and I think there is a future in Mormonism itself for a different attitude towards nature. The seeds were already always there. It's just that they didn't get emphasized. Um, somewhere along the way, uh, the culture became quite avaricious, you know, and focused on making money and and uh, exploiting resources. And um, now there seems to be signs of an awakening. And uh, all I can do is just try to nudge it along a little bit, but. Um, it appears to be happening, and the way things are going in the world, I think it's it's going to continue. And foremost among all of the concerns, I think, is climate change. You know, in fact, you know, people are starting to recognize here that it's it is in fact a big reason why we, Great Salt Lake is shrinking. It's not the only one. Why the Colorado River flow is slowing, etc. Um, and you know, little by little, they're starting to reckon with reality on that score. But yeah. to go back to the, the point that I wanted to make was, it, so this attitude towards nature at large is really rooted in history in part, but also in theology. Hmm. That was the theology that Mormonism started with. Um, and it was very much in line with the frontier mythology of the day. Yeah. Yeah, that's fascinating. That's a fa yeah, that's really fascinating stuff. I'm, I'm becoming increasingly interested in this part of our conversations. You know, the tradition, the history, or at least how um, how tied our identities are with with history, and how the psychology of that comes into play in the conversation more than I expected uh, on both sides, really. But we do, as Americans, tend to glorify history in whatever way serves us, particularly for a large group of Americans, the hunting. And ranching traditions are part of an American history that to them is very, very important to preserve. And I mean, I'm not surprised at all that that regardless of what the science of, you know, I guess professional biologists say, that that hunters, for example, will will just be partial to whatever whatever information supports the continuation of the tr tradition. And, and I don't really know how much thought goes into whether it's backed by research because the importance of the tradition overrides the answer. So something like this that's just so important to such a large group of Americans, um, I mean, do, do, you, do you think these traditions, do you think the hunting tradition is an important tradition to preserve in your mind for any reason? You know, if hunting were able to disappear, I wouldn't be think that was a bad thing. Is, is hunting right now an important tradition? Yes. Am I opposed to all hunting? No. I think, um, you know, it, it's a complex issue. I am opposed to hunting um, predator species. Why? Because it doesn't serve any scientifically valid purpose. Never been demonstrated to my satisfaction. I challenge people on this all the time. They never come up with anything. Um, so then I, you know, we talked earlier about the importance of science for informing our ethical positions. I remember having a conversation with Mike Bodenchuk, who's head of the <clears throat> Animal Damage Control Wildlife Services, as it's now called here in Utah, 20 years ago, when we were having meetings to develop Utah Wolf Management Plan. At some point in some context or other, I challenged him and 
on uh, something he said, and I can't recreate the context exactly, but he seemed quite put back. And so, well, why is that? And I said, because you're the one, it had something to do with killing predators. Let me put it that. I said, because you're the one that's talking about killing things. And, and he just stared at me. He never did answer. And it was like, it struck me that he never really thought of that as a, an ethical, as something requiring an ethical justification when it comes to other living creatures. You know, there might be pragmatic considerations, considerations of ownership, legality, et cetera, but it didn't seem to even enter his mind that there was an ethical reason not to kill other animals. <clears throat> One thing we've learned from wolves is how much they are like us. And I don't know if either of you guys have dogs or ever have, but if you've ever had a dog, especially if you spend any time with them hmm. outside hiking and exploring, which I've done, you know, you know that they're not just uh, soulless machine, natural machines, as the philosopher Descartes thought. No, you can communicate with them. And they, it's a two-way thing, and they have feelings. And um, somehow the tradition has been able to just sort of ignore that. It doesn't enter into their considerations when they entertain into the issues that the whole emphasis on is on defending their turf and their way of life and their view of things and truth doesn't have anything to do with it um so you got to educate the people that are educable and then culture will slowly change that's what i think that's the only thing that makes sense to me in your opinion how do you feel the future of wolves in Utah sits? Is it still in flux or is there, as you were saying, there seems to be more of this naturalistic view of uh, helping out or conservation with, with younger, these younger biologists you were speaking about. Do you think it's trending in the direction where Utah could feasibly have non-transient wolves, wolves that actually stay in the state, whether it's at a low number or whatever that may be? Well, I'm planning on sticking out, sticking it out to the, if my health holds up, you know, I don't die or something, until we have wolves in Utah, um, because that's kind of been the trajectory of everything I've been doing, you know. And I'm the I'm the one person in Utah most in a position to help facilitate the transition, frankly, um, at least from among the quote lay public, and. Uh, I think it will happen because wolves come here. They naturally come here. And once they're um, they're reproducing on in Western Colorado, of course they'll come here. Uh, if you look at the East Tavaputs Plateau, which is bounded by the Green River on the West, it extends all the way into Colorado, all the way to Rifle, Colorado, <laughs> hometown of Warren Bulbert. Um, and so wolves are going to be reintroduced into wild country that extends right into Utah. And that is the most prized big game hunting habitat in all of Utah. So there's going to be a huge battle. With that. And um, yeah, they'll be there. My hope is that we will, the state will learn from Colorado and not take after Idaho, Montana, Wyoming so much. Um, and so I had been involved with the Rocky Mountain Wolf Project right from the beginning. And I still kind of keep tabs on what's going on there. Same thing with the Mexican wolf recovery. I'm part of the quote, top secret global group that meets every so often to strategize. Um, and, uh, and I think it will happen in time, you know, but, I, and it'd be foolish, I think, to think that it's going to happen easily. We'll just have to see. We do have a plan, as I mentioned, but the plan right now says that um, would it only allow for two breeding pairs for two successive years, or two breeding pairs producing two surviving young of the year for two successive years before the plan has to be revised. Um, 
and that's there's another law actually that requires Division of Wildlife Resources to require to prevent the establishment of a viable pack of wolves in Utah, uh, anywhere where it has been delisted. So right now, fortunately, wolves are listed, and I hope they are. Uh, I hope Biden, you know, eventually does what he pretended he was going to do at one time, and uh, starts sticking up for wolves more, but. Um, you know, I I don't know if there's any more to say there. We're just going to have to wait and see how things unfold. And I'll be there along with Joni and others trying to move things along. And I'll say one, one or two other things because I know we're just about out of time. But, um, you know, if we had more people here in Utah working on these things, we could do more. And we could have more people working on them if we had more money. The, it's hard to get any money to, to do anything like this here in Utah. It's largely a, a volunteer effort. And our Western Wildlife Conservancy is the only organization of its kind in the entire state. So there's that. But I also mentioned that I've been working with groups, um, larger groups. And one of them I want to mention is Wildlife for All. There's a website, Wildlife for All. Um, dot us i urge people to check it out because i think this this is a really great organization and i'm on the um, advisory council and was uh, involved right from the very beginning and so i think it's going to, we've got people from all across the united states involved and is starting to have some influence and predictably that it's causing some controversy, but that's what needs to happen. So thank well, you. Uh, yeah, of course. No, we'll make sure that Western Wildlife Conservancy website and also Wild for All uh, is going to be in the description. So you guys can check that out, obviously, once uh, once you reach the end or as you're listening to it and you want to check it out. My final question for you, Kirk, is when you hear the word wolf, what is the thing that comes to your mind? Well, the night that I heard the Druid pack howling in Lamar Valley, and it was around 2001 or two, and it was a full moon that night, and they went out into their rendezvous point and began howling, and then a pack of coyotes up the valley started yipping back at them, and they went back and forth for about 10 or 15 minutes that way. And I just thought that was such a neat experience. If people could just have an experience like that, it would, I think it would change just about anybody's view. It's so primal and beautiful and uh, reminds us of the world so much bigger and more interesting than us and our part of it. So that was wildlife for all, by the way. Not just wildlife for all. Thank you. Thank you. For Absolutely. It. So I guess that's my parting thought. People <laughs> out there and enjoy our natural world. Yeah. It's a wonderful place. It's a wonderful place. Uh, Kirk, yeah. thank you for this really enlightening conversation. It really yeah, was. Th I mean, I learned a whole boatload. I'm sure Steve Stevens, I know his brain's churned with all this stuff. Well, thank uh, you to both of you. Appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for getting in touch. Absolutely, Kirk. Just hang for a minute. Uh, once we sign off, uh, just want to touch a couple of things, but Thank you for the convo. Uh, it was incredible. Uh, thanks for joining us. Health to you all out there. And Stephen, I'll be with you next time. Bye, everybody. Looking to support Wolf Connection or sponsor one of the wolves in our pack? Just go to wolfconnection.org, click on the Donate tab, and find out more information.